we met in 99 um, and I, you know, I used to release records in, on Washington Classics, and back then I used to put my mobile number on the on the label okay. and record, like, and ship them out. And he had a record store in Japan called Guinness Records, and he um, he was, would order my vinyl in. And um, one day he just called me. Wow. He just called. I was I was sitting in my room, and um, my phone rang, and it was him, and I, I didn't know who he was. His name was Seba Jun, also known as Nujabaz, one of the few hip-hop producers in Japan to break onto the world stage, a reality Seba wouldn't see coming. In his youth, making music was a passing thought. That was until 1998, when Seba opened his own label, Hideout Productions, with Funky DL, a British MC, as his first official collaborator. Their worlds were miles apart, but Jun was so passionate about DL's work that he needed to collaborate by any means, including paying for the plane ticket to his studio in Shibuya. Nujibes saw DL making the kind of music he envisioned, an East Coast hip hop sound. While some of Seba's first tracks included abstract beats, spacey production with some serious DJ scratching, it was Don't Even Try It with Funky DL that would set the course for Jun's approach as he went forward. Funny, since the topic of the song is how you shouldn't try an irk of DL's style, because no one can beat this. However, Nujibez wasn't trying to beat DL, but to discover his own style, which is what these collaborations pushed him to do. If it was through mixtapes, collections, or producing LPs. But his first album, Metaphorical Music, was Nujibez's turning point, where he became confident in his sound. He's from that era, he's from that sound, you know, that jazz fueled, mm. you know, laid back, almost melancholy, lamentful hip hop sound, you know, the Pete Rock, Dilla type, Gangstar type. It almost feels sad but uplifting. Even if things are bad, you can rise up against them. It's hopeful. This emotional resonance is palpable. You can feel it through the nostalgic beats seamlessly. While anyone could attempt to sample the new Jebez way, more so now than ever, it was Seba's dedication to his process that set him apart. Jun owned several record stores and would spend days digging for the finest rare grooves. They may not be as intricate as a J Dilla beat, but Nujibes' strength came from his project's purity. His minimal beats let the grooves dig deeper into the consciousness of the viewer, each choice crafted with painstaking detail. Ironic, because even if Nujibes' process seemed simpler, the level of equipment and time dedicated would say otherwise. Rather than JD's one-man band approach, firing out beats on the hour, Nujibes setup in contrast was a mixture of analog devices such as To go with that mixing, Seba sliced in fresh instrumentation to give that sampling more variety, achieving a sound that encapsulated the live experience. Even so, digital programs weren't off the table, but rarely digital samples. Nujabez lived and died on analog media, which is no surprise since he owned several stores full of it. The songs may take time to form, but the results speak for themselves. Nujibes took many old worldly tracks and distilled them into an energetic blend of production, making something new on metaphorical music, which brought a cohesion to his output lacking beforehand. At 15 tracks, we were going the distance. It's as smooth as ice, but nowhere as cold. The first track, Blessing It, brings this hypnotic piano with a track full of texture, drawing you into its world. The jazz improv of Horn in the Middle combines these archival sound bits into a new light, echoing the 90s instrumentation hip-hop style while making it his own. It's the calm before the breakbeat storm, each quote sticking with such reverence you'd expect them to only exist for the music telling the story of how John Coltrane separated from the Miles Davis Quintet to define his own musical path. We then move on to the Latin flavors of Lady Brown, one of the finest tracks on the LP, showing off Nujibes' trump card, his eclectic collective of MCs. With their dense wordplay, uplifting and conscious themes, 
on overcoming struggles and making the world a better place. But sometimes it can just be about smug wordplay on the bling era's butt. Wait, who's that, who's that cool then? Is that Latitude's Radical Remix? Which sounds like surfing through cyberspace in search for MP3s. In fact, one of the lines that gets more emphasis on this version is about sharing music through sound waves, internet waves, in a way that started Nujibes's career, connecting worlds that would never meet years before, which I relate to because I would have never became a music listener if it wasn't for that digital age. Metaphorical dedicates a large portion of the LP to its instrumental pieces, those at times serene and soulful takes with such warm and comforting samples for those downtrodden and overworked, such as Letter from Yoko Suka, produced by Uyama Hidroto, his saxophone erupting throughout. It was his first feature on a Nujibes project, but far from his last. Their relationship would continue throughout Seba's whole career. Hiroto's jazzy talents gave fresh flavor to each project, and jazz is something that was important to Seba. Every morning, he would wake up bright and early with an ice-cold latte in hand to perform saxophone. Without some of those classic records, I may not even be talking about this guy. The final track is an attempt to see how long Nujibes can stretch a beat, going for a whole eight minutes from one sample, pulling in stretch and distorting it to keep it going before it burns out, breaking it down piece by piece. Although, if there's one critique you could throw at this album, it's that despite the subtle movements, the instrumental songs could be tighter with less repetition. But as a starting point, metaphorical music is pretty good. In particular, the track Philo, featuring Shingo 2. Out of all his collaborators, Shingo 2 would go on to be Nujibes' most iconic, becoming best known for their Love Sick series, which upon its release turned heads in the underground. Yet, they'd break even more ground on their next project together. And how did he find these artists? That uh, I gathered the artists through various ways, but for all four artists that were used in Samurai Champloo, I've liked them uh, for quite a long time. And in the case of Force of Nature and Nujabes, uh, they were working for an independent label, and so I just called the label, and they were happy to get involved in the project. Mm. With Champloo, Watanabe needed to compete with his infamous legacy. However, Nujibes and company were also up against one of the most iconic soundtracks in anime, making it all the more impressive when I say their soundtrack surpasses Bebop. Well, I mean, maybe, I don't know. It's, it's hard to tell because they're completely different genres and how do you even quantify that? Another musician on the project, Fat John, of 5Ds, knew Nujabez as he produced and released another member of 5Ds, only solo project. When Fat John came to Tokyo, he'd visit Nujabez's studio and they'd just hang out, looking at each other's tracks, talking about cool drum samples and just having a bit of fun. It sounds like they all had a lot of freedom on this project to produce the way they wanted to. Yeah, shot like an edge of a samurai sword, the men to play, cut through flesh and bone, the my mind at peace, the world out of war. Battlecry's hard-edged hip-hop sets the tone of the show. For a song called Battlecry, it's serene, as if in the eye of a storm. There's an ethereal sample repeating a single note drenched in an undercurrent of fuzz. The subtle pulsing kick drum is a calm heartbeat next to the clash of the metallic snare. Piano chords swaying in and out, always off-key in its solo, off-kilter, like fading in and out on the battlefield. The lyrics speak about the ice-cold efficiency of a lone samurai. Even in life and death duels, their resolve is as steely as their blade. Come rain or shine, night or day, the battle of the samurai is never over until one man is dead. But they still must grow and mature to protect those they love. It's hot, and it will get you ready for that samurai action with a hip-hop soul. After the episode's over, the ED theme will make you reflective. Reworking a prior song, Beat Laments the World, with vocalist Minmi, her vocals adding another layer, fitting like the missing puzzle piece of the song. But we couldn't forget Aurorian Dance, every old video essay's hallmark, and not without reason. The track sets a relaxing and entrancing atmosphere. Spinning loops, catchy rhythms, peak Nujubes, if I do say so myself, rising to become one of his biggest tracks. The more samba and bossa nova vibe derives from its sample, The Lamp Is Low, which in itself is a Brazilian cover of a reworking of an even older French classical piece. Yeah, we're getting historic here. All those creative decisions intertwine so we could listen to Aurorian dance on YouTube while procrastinating. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful world out there. 
The highest accolade I can give the Shampoo soundtrack is it's one of the few animes where I won't skip the intro nor outro, to the dismay of Netflix, that is. It made hip-hop and anime a reality. Before, that idea was just a novelty, but now those two worlds live in harmony, solidifying the culture. No Shampoo, no lo-fi beats to study and relax to. The subject matter of Shampoo gained a sizable Western audience through its continued run on Adult Swim and later syndication on Toonami. It was a lot of people's first exposure to Nujibes' music, myself included. Not only was Nujibes a refreshing change of pace from the Bling era, but those listeners were about to be in for a special kind of surprise. I'll do whatever you want me to do, Kenny. In 2005, New Jabez released Modal Soul, considered by most fans to be the apex of his career. Now, why is that? Modal Soul is an improvement on MM in many ways. At 14 tracks, it's a pitch longer than metaphorical, even if you don't feel it, with stickier hooks that complement that intricate, textured soundscapes. Modal Soul is a full force display of Jun's strengths as a producer, many of the tracks having that straight up hit quality. Catchy, dense, but accessible. Starting off the album with heavy hitter Feather, Sis start on the beat, bringing his crystal smooth flow and clever wordplay, including a plethora of references to classic literature as he speaks of the struggle of the common man, wandering alone in the world, full of hurt and despair. But he's found his path to treat people better and pass on his message with a silver tongue until the day that he dies. While it's a simple enough message, Sistar's performance turns it into a statement of grandeur, like a religious experience. And this is where Nujabes' lush and focused sound transforms the song into an absolute classic. The same could be said for Original Joe or Reflection to Tunnel, their dreamlike atmosphere with rich melodies, those biting choruses that both recontextualize their lyrical samples into something brighter and bringing fresh life into those original recordings. Great stuff. Then we have Lovesick Part 3, where Shingo 2 returns after the success of Shampoo, striking with his Ronin style precision. The strings slice through the clouded backing instrumentation with waves of piano, bringing a nostalgic sense of longing as the chorus fires up. The song spins a tale of love and how music takes us through hard times. This sentiment resonated with listeners as part 3 became a favourite in the series. Out of all Nujibes' projects, Modal Soul houses some of the finest wordplay. Each of his five guest rappers bringing their own topics that all intertwine into this group philosophy. The album is front-loaded with these emotive vocal-driven tracks that grasp our attention, but then it loosens up for the, uh, the following tracks. You know, you have the jazz improv of Music Is Mine, the gentle tone of Eclipse, which is a distant love letter bringing us down to a tender space, opening up the room for a slam poetry session by Paste Rock, pushing the uh, conscious topics to the forefront in the sign. It's the halfway point to the album, a palate cleanser, you could say, almost an interlude. Also, Shakers, killing it. Thank You's playful energy leads into World Ends Rhapsody, a classic dance at the end of the world, its soulful mastery supported by such a wonderful collage of percussion to keep that rhythm alive, creating a rock-solid groove. Alongside flourishes of other instrumentation, an example of Nujibes' sampling at its best, self-titled highlights the mixture of Seba's defining influences, soul and jazz, I mean hence the title. The song brings a varied drum pattern next to a soothing horn sample that reverberates in the distance as Hiroto breaks into the foreground, playing one of the best melodies we've seen throughout their collaborative career. The last stretch of the album cools down, the instrumental cuts come out to play, but in comparison to metaphorical music, they bring a new versatility. The final track, Horizon, plays the same role as Peaceland in the last LP. It's the longest track at about 7 minutes 20, but has this late night vibe that takes you as if we were on the last train looking out to the horizon, rain trickling down the glass. Unlike Peaceland, where Isaac Hayes' sample repeats until broken, Horizon sampling takes a back seat to the instrumentation, the live instrumentation that is. Pianos and flutes swelling all around, building throughout the song, adding a new dynamic before the lights go out for good. 
Modal as a whole takes a balanced approach to collaborators and instrumentals. It has less MCs than the prior record, thus the focus becomes Nujibes bouncing off instrumentals, with a harmony between cohesion and mixing up the tone. The album is a breeze to get through, but not really to write about. Just, just know that this is one of my favourite hip-hop albums, check it out. After Modal Soul, information about Nujibes is scarce. Seba only participated in one written interview for Sound and Recording in 2003. He was a notoriously private person and wanted his music to stand by itself. What we can see at this point is Nujibes moving away from bigger projects like anime or his own records. He spends a little more time producing and collaborating within his own record label. In 2007, we see the release of Hideout Collection 2, a tighter anthology than the first, with a few of his finest tracks, specifically the track Imaginary Folklore, that hits a new dynamic for Nujibes. With Iko Koharada's longing and sorrowful performance, phantom pianos weep as Harada gives her whispered serenade, a cyclone of noise builds around her, only cut through by the horn section as Harada's voice rises, singing from the perspective of a woman looking at her city destroyed by a typhoon. Recontextualizing that ending chant into something lacking the typical Nujibes sentiment. Oh, and the rest is pretty cool too. With each passing hideout release, Nujibes took less center stage, producing his jazz companion Hiroto's first LP, then going on to master a couple tribute albums. Of course, live shows increased during this period, as his digital presence took an uprising through MySpace, YouTube, and the internet as a whole. There was a growing reputation, but that brought a new pressure. Nujibes was anxious about his legacy. And then he was, he was definitely not into it. Lamenting. Yeah, he was definitely lamenting the fact, and possibly he was at, at a loss on how he could top what he had done. Up, Evolve into something. Yeah, so he... I don't think he wanted to make the exact same music he was known for. He was looking into different styles. And I can understand that as an introvert, being the center of attention wasn't going to be what Seba wanted. Is this the reason we didn't see a modal soul follow up in this four year period? I'm sure there's a lot of factors into this, so this is all speculation on my part. And we gotta say that while being introverted, Seba showed a bold attitude to go for what he wanted. In this period, he would move away from the city to live by the coast. And as of 2009, we do know he was working on something. Today I have some very somber news for the international hip-hop community, community. The lost especially world, fans in the independent hip-hop scene and, scene and, and those who have followed my career. More. On February 26, 2010, nine years ago, Jun Seba passed away after a tragic car accident. Later, Hideout Productions announced a posthumous album will be released next year. This became 2011's Spiritual State. Would this be a change up in his style, redefining how we see Nujibes? Well, not really. Spiritual State is 14 tracks into the Celestial, moving away from the melancholy and uplifting contrast of his prior LPs, but still recognizably a Nujibes experience. Uyama Hiroto finished the album as a whole. While not as polished as prior projects, that's not a bad thing. It starts strong. The live performances of Hiroto's piano, accompanied by a light percussion, bursting through the serenity comes a booming sax, played in contrast to classical Japanese arrangements, east and west merging together. Sky is Tumbling featuring Sistar begins with a spellbinding loop. A spiraling piano pulls you further into those dreamscapes. Gone Other Days has these pulsing live drums, hi-hats, sinking you further into that jazz-coated realm. The pretext of hip-hop all but mounts away, only popping in to remind you, yes, there are a couple MCs here, and yes, occasionally the drums do come out of machines. Spiral is an evolution of reflection eternal style. It echoes of a baroque voice from the past, brought to the present. And then what follows after is the phantom of old jazz rising through these instrumental vignettes. The embers of city lights into the color of autumn, dawn on the side, rainy way back home. But there's a lack of variety in sound or tone here. Even if at times this journey is mesmerizing, the sleepy side becomes too overpowering. That is with the exception of Yes featuring Paste Rock, punching life into the scene, its percussion chunky and pulling the rest of the sound into a vortex, Paste Rock's rhythmic performance standing tall. Life, dance, stay free, we live. A unique piece amongst its contemporaries. 
Next, the Plunderphonic Detour Fellows pulls Nujabes full circle back to the late 90s while waiting for the clouds, sees a sour message about dealing with depression using creative outlets to fight back, learning to deal with bad things from your past and move forward into a brighter future. If only those clouds would move a little quicker. It's a classic Nujabes joint that plays with hope and melancholy, not seen on the rest of the album. Prayer dips us back into the ether, an ethereal trip through the ocean of flutes, serenaded by a distant vocal gliding us into the final track, Island, which is like a deserted island itself. On the beach, at sunset, its delay-laden percussion sets a slow beat, reverberating pianos washing over the shore, soft flutes in the air, a favourite of Seba's, shakers next to bongos, the whole track feels akin to a long goodbye. Even if it's shorter than the two prior ending tracks, it's a soothing finish if it tones down the whole experience before it fades out and vanishes for good. Spiritual State is a good release, at times fantastic, especially the first four songs. Mellowness and Serene Vistas are the name of the game here, perhaps a reflection of his new studio location, or just his mood at the time. The project is a quarter turn in direction, yet I don't think it was ever trying to reinvent his style. But celebrate it, and we know it wasn't 100% complete before he passed away. How finished was it? Well, we'll never know. But I imagine the recording must have been finished and maybe some of the mixing if his record label was to go out of their way to release it, and not all of his other, like, scrapped, unfinished content that was lying around. So I, I don't think this was a decision made for quick profits, if that's what you're thinking. Yes, Modal Soul is a better album, but that doesn't mean Spiritual State isn't worth a listen. Now, where was Shingo 2 in all this? Well, he was working on his own. Nujibes collapse, creating a lovesick hexology with Hiroto. You know, you have to give me something that I can't refuse. You know, give me a beat that's good enough that I can't refuse. So, you know, we actually did a lot of back and forth and two of the beats that he sent me, you know, one was part four and one was the basis foundation and you know, it became part five. And part six, you know, we discovered it you know, after he passed, but he, already, he had already titled it. These tracks are a true send-off to Nujabes and his legacy. Now, legacy was something that Nujabes struggled with in the past. Living up to his prior successes was tough. Seba Jun was a lot of things. A producer, a great curator, who went out of his way to get talent from all over the globe. Yet at the same time, in his own words, he was just a regular guy. A short introverted dude who loved noodles maybe a bit too much. And that's the beauty of his legacy. You know, it may be the story of a tragic musician taken before his time. People deify them, turn them into idols beyond reality. And when they've left us a huge cultural impact, it can be inevitable. You know, it's the legacy of a man who's seen as irreplaceable. While no one will be the next Nujabes, this isn't within his message, which is anyone can enjoy music. Anyone can make music. Taking that passion and turning it into something that reaches people to resonate with them for years to come, leaving a mark. In the digital space, with the rise of lo-fi hip-hop, study beats, and countless other channels, Nujibes is looked at as the grandfather of lo-fi, so I think he got his wish in the end. So let's end this with a tribute to Nujibes. Rest in beats, and let the spirit of music making live on in your collaborators and fans. This was one of his favourite songs. If you want to learn more about the genre Nujibes brought to prominence, lo-fi hip-hop, check out Pad's video on Ginseng over here. So thank you to the patrons, especially Fernando Diaz and Behinox, among everyone else. You really make this a lot easier to do. Next time, we're going to be talking about Watanabe. So I'll see you then, Space Cowboys. Later.